Good morning, happy Australia Day later in the week and welcome to Outsiders, now in its eighth year. The show that is to political correctness gone mad and woke identity politics. What comedian Rob Schneider is to the entire woke artifice of diversity and inclusion. The CEO of United Airlines last month, the CEO, he announced of all the hiring for all the new pilots that are coming up this year, all the hiring for the new pilots, the main focus is going to be diversity. Woo! What? <laughs> diversity? Not the best pilots you can find? <laughs> the ones with the most hours of experience? Things you've done before? No nope, diversity. I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of flying all the time with these white pilots landing safely and on time. <laughs> Boring. And now let's touch down safely with the latest Outsiders News. Well, James and Liz, the Qantas brand has suffered a massive plunge. The estimated value of its brand has gone down after a horror year with lawsuits and the public criticising it, falling 22 places in the national rankings. It's a long fall from grace for Qantas, which in 2019 was rated Australia's strongest brand, James. Well, and it's of no surprise, I think, to anybody who's watching today, and by the way, Great to see you guys here and happy 2024 for the first outsides of the year. But We're yeah, back. Qantas uh, is, you know, it has been in free fall, I think, for at least five or ten years now. And I can tell you something, as somebody who migrated to this country 23 years ago, who first started flying back and forth to Australia on Qantas, remembers what a great airline it was, how warm it was, how good the service was, uh -huh. how when something went wrong, they made sure that it was fixed you know, with a smile and cheerfully, to see what they have done to it. What happened under Alan Joyce's tenure, and you know, it's not just the voice. It's not just the woke politics. It was about the entire way that they decided to carve up the business and turn it simply into something that was no longer an icon of Australia, but just simply about bottom line mm. bonuses for executives. And yes. that's it. Saving money, cutting corners, ruining the brand. And no wonder that people no longer like or trust this once great, iconic airline. And I think it does, Australia, a lot of harm around the world just from that sort of soft power point of view to say, oh, you know, we don't have a national flag carrier that people have really great associations with anymore. Well, Liz, it seems kind of symptomatic, doesn't it, of the whole kind of collapse of Australia. We'll talk in a second about Australia Day and how the Albanese government is, is doing its utmost to try and trash that. But doesn't it seem symptomatic, as James said, one of the great Aussie brands... Mm. Now, the spirit of Australia, it called itself, yeah. now down in the dumps. Once an icon, which is what they want to happen to every single Aussie icon. You're not allowed to feel a sense of national pride about anything. And what you once did have national pride in, they're just determined to make it embarrassing now. But I think it's important to note that this is the estimated value. So we've yet to see this really reflected, I think. I remember doing a, a Vox Pop on the street just last year and that's when we were in the heat of it. Qantas was under major fire making headlines every single day and people on the street were still just like no I fly with who I've always flied with. I book flights the same as I've always booked flights. I jump on, I know my dates and I pick the best option at the time. So you do wonder how much this is actually resonating with the public because at the end of the day we just choose the best deal at the time. Whereas we in media land just go, oh, this is absolutely, we're across it all. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not sure that that's right, Liz, because I've certainly, speak, people I speak to go, oh, Qantas, I'm not happy with it. I don't like it. You know, I'd rather go Virgin. I'd but when they jump online, that. what deal are they Yeah, but Liz, you know, I'll tell you what, though, when people, you know, you, you, you want to quantify stuff, though. You know, it is stuff like baggage handling statistics. It's things like on-time arrivals. And when they had that huge plunge in the ability of them simply to get you and your bag to the same place, 
People who are, you know, even if they're reasonably price sensitive, are going to say, well, if it's this one or 100 bucks more for that one, and there's a better chance of not having, you know, the first three days of my holiday ruined because the bag didn't come with me to wherever I'm going, people are going to, I think, spend some extra money if they can to try and buy in sure, some of that but reliability. Those, those problems aren't exclusive to Qantas. No, I think that's across true. That's the true. board, that's true. airlines simply aren't what they used to be. You used to get like two course meals, et cetera. These days, it's literally whatever they bring down the aisle. And unless you have your card on you, they don't take Apple Pay. And it's just gross snacks that nobody really wants but buys out of desperation. So I think across the board, airlines are simply not what they used to be. Flying is not the experience that it used to be. There you go. OK, well, let's talk about another iconic Australian brand, supposedly, Woolworths. And uh, we've had uh, Woolworths being uh, slammed by people like Peter Dutton, I support his call to boycott Woolworths if you are unhappy about the way they have publicly come out and said that they won't be supporting Australia Day. Now, this has had a lot of controversy behind it. People saying, well, you know, uh, what's uh, politics, uh, politicians got to do with this? You know, it's a free market business, etc., etc." The thing that really disturbed me was this comment from Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister. Have a listen. Woolworths, if no one's buying the product, Guess what? The jobs disappear. Uh, my government is concerned with the fight against inflation. Peter Dutton's concerned about fighting culture wars. So, for so many things wrong with that, Liz and James. First of all, fighting the culture wars, no. Uh, Peter Dutton is not fighting the culture wars. What we have is an assault on our culture, a cultural assault from the left, which has been going on and on for years and years. And what we have is a cultural defence from people on the conservative side of politics saying, let's defend those values and those things that are precious. Now, one of the most important things for a prime minister to do, for a government to do, apart from securing our borders, which they are, seem incapable of doing, or defending our role and our allies around the world, which they seem incapable of doing, is to support national national cohesion and national culture. James, I find it appalling that you have a Prime Minister who is so dismissive, treats Australia Day, our national day. So many citizens became Australians on Australia Day. Mm. It's a very special day to Australia. Here's a Prime Minister right. just dismissing it. Oh, because nobody's buying the product. Well, here's the product, Albo. Two Aussie thongs. I've got mine. I urge people to go out and buy as much Australia Day product as they can possibly find. Flags, you name it. And let's get the consumers to prove that Anthony Albanese is wrong, James. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, too, with this, Rowan, and I'm really glad that you mentioned that point about citizenship and citizenship on Australia Day, because during the break, we learned that 81 councils, local government areas across the nation, had taken up the opportunity, if you want to use that word, that Anthony Albanese gave them back in November of 2022, so just months after taking uh, taking over the top job, to shift their citizenship day from Australia, now, Australia Day. This is, I think, such a cynical move, because mm. not only does it continue the left, and let's remember, Anthony Albanese comes from the hard socialist left faction of the Labour Party. This decision means that generations now of new Australian citizens will no longer associate the day that they joined the mm. Australian family with Australia Day. And you can see the real cynicism of that. But beyond that, though, on Woolies, you know, you see all of these people out there and they say, oh, well, you know, it's just... Willie's doing, you know, doing, uh, you know, their own sort of market thing. And I mean, Albanese is out there trying to tell supermarkets what they can charge for a bag of onions. Yes. You know, suddenly <laughs> deciding that he's a great free marketeer is really ironic. Um, but, you know, it is absolutely of a piece with the decision of Woolworths, with their CEO, Brad Banducci, with all these other companies, we talked about the airlines too before, to go and push again the voice. You know, there's uh, people are say, oh, no, they're not related. No, of course they're related because, absolutely. again, it's back to this point of trying to use their corporate power to remake our relationship with this country, which, I'm sorry, is an exceedingly successful one and which, by the way, I'm sorry, which modern Australia did start on January 26th, yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> back when the first fleet landed at Port Jackson, and, you know, is something that everybody here should be proud of and should stop saying, oh, well, you know, yeah, sure, we've got our problems, our history, fine, do that another day. Well, Liz, uh, the, you know, one of the important things here 
is that uh, the idea that uh, somehow uh, Woolworths don't need to stock Australia Day material any longer because nobody's buying it. They don't come out and publicly say, oh, we're not running this brand of, of, of marmalade or whatever anymore. They came out and publicly took a stance and said, we're not going to stock Australia Day material. So I would argue that Australian consumers have to teach Woolworths a lesson and also have to go and support all those companies that are putting forward the material if they value Australia Day. Uh, 100%. We know that this has got more to do with the stakeholders of Woolies. I'll be speaking more about that later in the show. But they are pushing an agenda. They were busted just this week, just gone by 2GB, who'd looked through their reconciliation plan. Why on earth does Woolworths, a supermarket, need a reconciliation action <laughs> plan? And in that plan... They, they said they were going to fly the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags outside some stores and other sites. Why on earth is this happening? Let's just take a moment to appreciate the absurdity of that. Last year, this same supermarket was campaigning for constitutional change. That's right, exactly. You're a supermarket for crime. You can't have it loud. both ways. You're 100%. You can't have it both ways. So punish Woolworths, I say, and punish Aldi and yeah. punish Kmart. Go for them. The Australian Open, uh, they've decided they won't uh, celebrate Australia Day, so let's take the word Australian out and just call it the Open from now on because it doesn't deserve to be uh, the Australian Open, which has always traditionally uh, fallen around Australia Day. Uh, shame on and them yeah. as well. I'm sorry. Shame on them. And yet, guys, you know, this is one of these issues, and I kind of feel like Australia now, you know, we've got this two-third, one-third divide, and yet the yes, one-third divide 40. is, um, you know, is is always the loud group that controls, you know, a lot of the institutions, academia, media, uh, the C-suites of the ASX 100 companies. They are very, very much, you know, against Australia Day. They find any sort of expression of nationhood, patriotism, exceedingly offensive and embarrassing. You know, I don't think many people from the Woolworths C-suite are going to be having big Australia Day barbecues on Friday. Sorry, I just can't imagine a lot of that's going to be happening. And yet... Yes, but they'll happily folk, take the bonuses from all the, the snags and the all money, the sausages that are sold. This is the thing, and I think, Peter Dutt, in putting aside the call for Woolworths, I think, you know, the opportunity here is to have a bigger conversation about why Australia is something that's, A, worth being proud of, and B, mm. worth supporting, and C, worth celebrating. And it's that free and easy celebration of Australia Day that we used to have with the music and the barbecue and the pools and everything else that, you know, these guys find so tortured because they cannot ultimately enjoy the free and easy success of Australia and Australian culture. Yeah, absolutely. So I would urge all Australians to go out and celebrate like it's Australia Day on Australia Day and really, really go for it. As I said, I've got my thongs here ready. Hope you've got yours as too. And a flag at the flags. I get thought of it. Uh, a Outsiders fan sent in this uh, adapted version of a colouring in contest from uh, Coles. I think it was suggesting this is how they should do it. Actually, get the Aussie flag in there. Actually, get no longer fresh food people. Just woke Woolworths and don't try including a minority by rejecting the vast majority. So someone there's had a bit of fun with that idea. Um, but it gets worse because in Melbourne apparently they seem to have lost Australia Day, James. Jacinta Allen's looking around going, oh, what do we... I don't know. We forgot to mention it to anybody. Uh, this is a deliberate strategy by the hard left in this country. We saw... We, we, the game was given away when Stephen Smith at Australia house in London a few be, uh, before Christmas said, oh, we won't be celebrating Australia Day. This isn't accidental. This is deliberate. This is, again, a war by the left against you, your values, your tradition, your grandparents, your history, your citizenship, as James reiterated. Mm -hmm. This is a war against you and your values, trying to replace them with an alternative set of values. It is Marxist, it is wrong, and the way to defeat it is to fight back a culture war where we win by celebrating Australia Day like crazy with the flags going berserk and shame those individuals who don't participate, James. Well, indeed, Rowan, and I mean, as the old saying goes, living well is the best revenge, so going and having a good yeah. time is the best way to stick it up, these people who are just complete miserableists. But, you know, what you're saying, Rowan, is correct, because... They have a view of kind of Australian history, right, that says from 60,000-plus years ago to 1788, Edenic utopia here. Then 
British arrive. Everything is hellacious, horrible theft, <laughs> dispossession, until Guff Whitlow becomes <laughs> prime minister. And then, you know, through this long and rocky road with some unfortunate periods like, you know, John Howard being prime minister and Tony Abbott being prime minister, we're just on this uplift, a sudden uplift path uh, towards the, the sort of new socialist multicultural yes. utopia. But... You know, this also, I think, really creates another big problem. We really do need to, I think, and I want to have a big conversation in this country about social cohesion because we're bringing in a huge number of migrants. Okay, fine. But if you're bringing in a huge number of migrants saying you want them to become citizens, want them to become part of the Australian family, great. But then you can't bring them in and come in and tell them that the country that they're joining is mm. terrible, racist, illegitimate and then have their kids go to schools and have them taught that the country that their parents decided that they were going to adopt for them to have a presumably a better life is also you know racist illegitimate stolen land and all of that and this is i think the much bigger conversation it's not just an australia day conversation this is a 365 day a year conversation and australia is facing huge challenges economically, internally, well, let's pick up. Let me just jump in there. And if we're going to fight for this country, we need to hang together. Well, let's jump in on the, the economic side of it, James and Liz. We've seen uh, uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics figures coming out revealing a sharp fall in manufacturing productivity. Oh, I wonder why that could be. You start dismantling your coal mines. You start dismantling uh, your manufacturing base. You just, just start demonising the fossil fuels that have made us such a wealthy and prosperous nation. Oh, what a surprise. Suddenly the figures are there saying that Albanese and Jim Chalmers are destroying the productivity of this country, James. Make no mistake, not only the culture of this country, they are destroying the economy of the country and they are destroying the international reputation of this country. This government is an absolute disgrace, Liz. Yes. And uh, the figures are now in showing what they are doing to our country economically. It is a disaster, Liz. Absolutely. It was just this week that we saw that over 1,600 manufacturing and construction companies, so kind of important to Rather. the future of absolutely any nation. If you don't have those two things happening, what does your future look like? Short answer, you simply don't have one. So, Albanese was asked this week, <laughs> what about that reconstruction building fund of $15 billion that you're a government announced last year with great fanfare saying, oh, look, we're, we're taking this measure to help out these guys to make sure Australian builders, construction, manufacturers won't go under to this extent. Today he was asked by a very brave journo, sorry, not today, This the week just gone, so what about that fund? Because you don't even have a mechanism in place yet for these guys to apply to access those funds. You'll never guess the Prime Minister's response. <laughs> the Liberal Party seem to, seem to be upset that there's not an online form that you can fill in. This isn't an online uh, form process as if you were applying uh, for a, uh, a packet of chips from the supermarket. Like a packet of chips from the supermarket. <laughs> James. <laughs> James, this is just... Is are it? you kidding me? They're going under. They're trying to access the money that you said would help them Look, not go under. It's all I'm going to say here is I'm glad we're talking about productivity because this, again, is the great sort of scam that is being put on people. You know, they're growing the GDP artificially by inflating the migrate, migrant intake, mm -hmm. but the pieces of the pie are getting smaller. This is why household incomes are going backwards. This is why young people are angry that they... They can't get into a home because the government has made the conscious choice not to improve productivity but to chase industry offshore, not to reform the economy, and we are all going to be poorer for it. Absolutely. Now, exciting to have Liz here with us on Outsiders. Rita will be back next week. James and I are back from our holidays. We're great to be back with you and hope you all had a fantastic time. Now, we are making a few changes to the show. Ooh, take your notes out. As they say in the entertainment world, sometimes you have to kill your darlings. And we are putting Ice Age Watch on ice for the time being. After all... We figure if you still believe the extremist global boiling garbage being spouted by the climate cult after five years of me demonstrating the precise opposite, 
then there's little hope for you, I'm afraid. But that doesn't mean we won't be attacking the madness of the climate cult right here every single week. We've got a brand new segment called Net Zany, the insane world of climate politics where the three of us will be exposing and mocking the lunacy of Net Zero and all the other eco idiocy with special guests and lots of humour and solid, factual, informed opinion. Plus, we have another brand new segment in place of Ice Age Watch where I'll be donning the top hat and coattails and cracking the whip for Ringmaster Rowan's clown show. A peek under the burly griffin big top at all the crazy antics from Al Bozo the clown to slapstick clowns like buffoon Bowen to scary clowns. Well, you'll just have to stick around and who I've got for you this week. There are so many Labour clowns I get to choose from. But right now, let's delve into the insanity that is net zero and the bizarro world of climate change politics in a brand new Outsider segment, Net Zany. Well, James and Liz, we've often talked on this show about the damage being done to children and young people by this endless propaganda about climate change. James, we now have a really sad story out of the States about what happens when you brainwash kids into believing the global boiling nonsense. Yeah, basically, this teenager, Jacob Graham, 19 years old, told a jury, told a court, told authorities that he wanted to kill at least 50 people, and he said, in revenge for, quote, living in a society that was destroying his itself. His grievances were motivated by hatred of the government and by ecological concerns. Now, this is something that we have seen in the culture since at least the Unabomber. You remember that guy yep. from back in the 80s? Um, this is this where this environmental hard green nihilism, which hates humanity, hates human beings. We see this attitude in a lot of government policy, which sees humans as basically a virus, our activity as a cancer on the planet. Well, Unfortunately, people who have problems are going to be seeing this. They're going to take it seriously. I'm predicting this year we're going to see more of this sort of eco-terrorism, and that's what it is mm. in the news in the United States, and I worry about here too. And, Liz, the flip side of this story out of Canada, so earlier uh, last year there were these big Canadian wildfires, they call them, bushfires, uh, and, of course, there was Justin Trudeau and all the loveys out there blaming this on climate change. <laughs> when, in fact, we now learn it was a 22-year-old man who was responsible, Liz. Absolutely. And have we heard a retraction from Trudeau? Ooh, no. Has anyone heard an apology or any kind of, like, I was wrong about all that? Absolutely not. They talked it up at their... And this was massive. It forced 6,000 people out of their homes. The damage was was extensive and once again we find out that what happened in the name of climate change was a complete farce. And, and well you know with Justin Trudeau we're always talking about a black face or white issue so you know. <laughs> very good. Well thank goodness they've got Pierre Poilievre over there he's one of my new heroes uh, oh, either this year marvelous. or next year we should see him as the Canadian Prime Minister because Trudeau is a complete joke. But one thing James I want you know we've all had our, our summer holidays now I was uh, preparing, got the gutters cleaned and did all that, preparing for a horror, horror summer of bushfires uh, here on the East Coast because we were told repeatedly it was going to be the hottest and driest summer. Every time I looked at the uh, Bureau of Meteorology prediction for the next day, it was, oh, it's going to be 30 or 39 or 32. It never was. It was always out by about four or five degrees, James. Well, yeah, I mean, look, you know, you cleaned the gutters, I scrubbed the pool and got the ice maker <laughs> fired up because I thought it was going to be a big summer full of, you know, weekend barbecues and parties, but not so Don't much. Don't you but... know by now that whatever the bomb says, well, you do the exact opposite. There's a serious side opposite. to this, so There's a serious side to this, Liz, because of over the break, I went out on a big drive across country Australia. I went all the way through country New South Wales, country Victoria, South Australia. I met a ton of farmers and people in local communities, and they all said the same thing. They said the Bureau of Meteorology plus the ABC went and got this completely wrong. They warned us about an El Nino, and there are receipts on this. You can go back and see Absolutely. what they were saying, 100%. where they said, oh, it's going to be a hot, dry summer, horror so, bushfires, no rain. What happened? Well, an awful lot of these farmers, they sold off their herds, they sold off their lambs, they sold off their beef. 
plunged the prices, crashed the prices, so they all lost money on this. And then they wound up saying, oh, we could have kept these herds going over the summer, so we're going to have a huge spike again in prices when they have to restock all of their herds and there's a shortage of beef and lamb out on the market. But beyond that, too, they're all saying we simply cannot trust the BOM because it has been captured by the climate narrative and the need to create climate scare stories. They are now paying private meteorological services to go and give them forecasts, which they say are far more accurate and far less politicized. So you want to talk about the cost of living, you know, exactly. you want to talk about what is causing your groceries to go up, the beef and lamb that you want to buy to feed your family, also how the crops are harvested, when you plant, when you harvest. All of that is being affected by the bomb, which people are supposed to be able to rely on, which is running a political agenda and scaring people and getting it wrong again. And let me pick up on that, Liz. Um, we had... Uh... Uh, on this show on Outsiders, David Burton from the Inigo Jones Facebook page. Now, David Burton is one of those private individuals who puts forward his own predictions based on, 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 on the Inigo Jones uh, uh, patterns and things of the past. We've had him on the show to explain it all. He argues that he got it right all through this summer and those people that were listening to him and following his forecast, and it's a private business, obviously, that he runs, those farmers were in a position to actually make the correct choices, which they did. And James is 100% correct. It's not just a climate change political thing when the Bureau get it wrong with the Bureau of Meteorology. If they are getting it wrong, it's no different to financial advisors getting it wrong or anybody else getting it wrong. It has disastrous impacts on people's lives and livelihoods. There needs to be a full investigation into the Bureau of Meteorology. And meanwhile, I'm not allowed to give financial advice, so I wouldn't give financial <laughs> but let me just say, if you are a farmer, it would be worth checking out David Burton's Inigo James page to see what you think about his predictions, Liz. Morris Newman was doing work about the inaccuracy of the bomb years ago, and I remember reading his articles. It was absolutely... They'll all still be online, and I encourage people to go find them and read them because this is nothing new. They have not only been captured by the climate change narrative, they are one of the principal bodies now promulgating it and because who would question the bomb? They're so legitimate. They've been around for a while. They've got all the technology. They should be able to tell us when the next drop of rain's going to fall or if it is going to be a dry summer. Who in their right mind would be like, nah, the bomb's got it wrong and I'm well, correct? Well, there you go, and James's yes. holiday vacation. I'm sorry. Can I say one thing, though, Liz? You know, you kept calling it the bomb. Well, I'm sorry. They spent a lot of money last year trying to convince everybody Which to is call why it I... the Bureau. The Bureau. The Bureau. 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 <laughs> call it the bomb. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Now, just very, very quick. Quickly, um, there have been big talking of farmers, lots of protests over in Europe, France, Germany, uh, amazing footage coming out of those places where the farmers are rebelling. It all boil basically boils down to climate change policies which are leading to these. There's various different things, removal of diesel subsidies, so on. Each country has different things that are at issue, uh, but directly or indirectly, they tend to relate back to uh, the... the everyday people being fed up with climate change, net zero type policies. There will be a reckless renewables rally. The ABC are allowed to, uh, to advertise Invasion Day, so we're going to advertise the reckless renewables rally in Canberra, which is on February the 6th, the Tuesday at 10 a.m. So if you uh, are a farmer or not a farmer, if you happen to be uh, unhappy about those windmills or transmission lines, there's your place to go. Plenty more after the break. Benji Irby and Shemeika Michelle. Plus, we've got Jacinta Price with us on the show. Lots more happening. James's Donkey Vote in a tick. Hello and welcome back to the very first Outsiders of 2024. I'm James Morrow here as always with Rowan Dean. And for one more week until rambling Rita Panahi gets back <laughs> from her adventures, Liz Storer. Anyway, I hope you all had a relaxing Christmas and New Year and just maybe got to take a bit of a break. But now, of course, it's back to work. That means back to work for everyone, including President <laughs> or President-ish Joe Biden, who, after four or five weeks of R&R, &R, managed to glue himself together, only to once again fall apart before our very eyes. Here he was at the White House just yesterday, giving some helpful advice on how 
you out there, any men out there, can have a happy marriage. I tell every young man who's telling me, I'm thinking of getting married or something. I said, look, I, you have any advice? They said, yeah, pick a family with five sisters or more. And they look at me, what the hell is that all about? I said, it's really simple. That way, one of them always loves you, not the same one. <laughs> you always have somebody on your side. <laughs> okay, that's Ooh. some interesting family dynamics there. But of course, you know, while Joe's giving a speech, it's never a Biden speech without the creepy whisper. <laughs> and when I started the job, I kept talking about the need for deal with the, with the environment. So we don't have a problem. Anybody think climate's not a problem? Raise your hand. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I've been around the world. Come on, man. He also had his usual problems fighting his greatest foe, the teleprompter. <laughs> Americans have filled 16, filed 16 new, 16 million new business applications since I became president. Ah, seriously, when he goes on down this road, I think he actually really needs to spend more time listening to his wife. If Joe were here, she said, Joe, hush up, boy. <laughs> hush up, boy. That's some good advice for Joe Biden. But anyway, back to the holidays. And again, did you have a good break? Because I hope so. And I know I did because I took the opportunity to do something that one day might see me up on charges for offenses to the climate. You see, I drove from Sydney to South Australia and back over a couple of weeks, not in an electric pus box of the sort Joe Biden and Anthony Albanese would prefer we all get around in, but in a great growling muscular 5.0 liter V8 that, that growls with all the enthusiasm and drinks petrol with all the enthusiasm of Frank Sinatra tossing back a pitcher of martinis. It was, in fact, the sort of vehicle noted car enthusiast Joe Biden might have himself once enjoyed tooling around in once upon a time. At least he discovered that his classic Corvette was more useful as a shield behind which to hide classified documents. <laughs> no, these days Joe Biden has been bitten by the climate bug, which means that he is more of an EV man now, at least when he's not riding around in the presidential limo. Okay, here we go. You ready? See it, sir. You ready? <laughs> Mr. President. This sucker's quick. I Let's check out just how Joe Biden's electrical ve vehicle fantasy is doing as it, well, collides with reality. So these drivers came to charge their batteries in the cold, but these charging stations are not working in Evergreen Park. Same story. Take a look at that area right there near 95th and Western. We found several Tesla owners there stranded with dead batteries from the cold and not enough working charging stations at that location. We talked to a driver here in Oak Brook where we are who tried to call Tesla for help and nothing. Okay, yesterday I was here and uh, there was just lines of cars, but there was only a couple charging working, but it seemed very disorganized, like no one knew what to do and a lot of people were just led here by their cars. Okay, so they so were abandoned, basically. It looks like off the test track, Joe Biden's beloved electric vehicles aren't so, well, hot. Instead, it turns out that electrical vehicles are not so good in the cold, which is a bit of a problem in places like Chicago, where that clip was just from, and indeed, much of North America. But even if not for an everyday driver, surely Joe Biden's beloved electric vehicles, which are gonna save the climate, are maybe good for at least a holiday rental, right? Wrong. Last week, Hertz Rent-A-Car revealed that it is going to sell a third of its U.S. electric vehicle fleet and reinvest the funds in, you guessed it, petrol-powered cars due to weak demand and higher repair costs. Gosh, ugh, doesn't really seem like the propaganda we've been told. I mean, we're finding out that EVs are not great in the cold, Nobody wants for a rental, and contrary to what their backers claim, they're actually more expensive to run. 
I wonder how things are going now for that electric Ford pickup that Biden was so keen on. Latest sign of a slowing demand for EVs. Ford announcing it's reducing production of its F-150 Lightning. For that, we're going to turn to Phil LeBeau this morning. Morning, Phil. Good morning, Carl. This is Ford announcing on April 1st that it will be cutting its production of the F-150 Lightning going from two shifts, which it currently operates at its Rouge complex just outside of Detroit, where they build the F-150 Lightning. They're going to bring that down to one shift starting on April 1st. Some of those workers, about 1,400 impacted, they're going to be transitioned over to uh, additional production for the Bronco and the Ranger. This is, if you're thinking to yourself, wait a second, didn't they just cut their guidance in terms of EV production, yeah, they did that last month. Basically cut their 2024 production plan in half, and now they are saying we are going to be cutting lightning production again. Indeed, these are the same Ford F-150 EVs that Chris Bowen here said were going to save the weekend and the planet at the same time. Well, not so much. Because according to Fortune magazine, EV sales in the U.S. are failing to meet expectations and not even generous subsidies and tax breaks are enough to keep demand going. So, like everything else Biden and the progressive environmental left touch, it turns out that interfering with the market and trying to overthrow proven technology like the internal combustion engine just doesn't pay. As even Joe Biden himself knew once upon a time. Sounds good. <laughs> Try your brakes. They're good. Fantastic. Thanks, James. Well, let's go to America. What so much has happened over the past few days, Donald Trump, who this show began the night that Donald Trump was elected president of the US, and two people who have been with us on that ride for the last eight years are, of course, former cab driver from New York, Benji Irby, and Shemeika Michelle from Carolina. Great to see you both. Trump is back in the saddle, or so it would appear. This is great stuff. We want to see a lot of you two during the year as we keep track on the journey to the White House for Donald Trump. So uh, I'm, I called it a year ago, said he would be the next president of the USA. What do you think, Shemeika Michelle? Listen, first of all, I have a little embarrassment knowing that other countries are laughing at the president we have now. I just feel a little peace when I know that Australians know I wasn't one of the idiots that actually voted for him to be in office. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I am so excited about what's happening with Donald Trump, him winning the Iowa caucus, and I'm just really excited. You know, I think that he stands a very good chance, although he has all of these you know, cases against him right now. People see that it's not real. They understand that this is election interference and that this is just the other side really coming after their opponent and trying to do whatever they can to stop the person that really needs to be in the White House. Liz. Impeached twice, indicted four times, the lawsuits are piling up. But, Benji, it certainly doesn't seem to be reflecting in the Republicans' popularity for Donald Trump. They absolutely love the guy. He looks like he's going to romp it in in terms of becoming the Republican nominee. Well, it's because all this stuff is petty, it's fraudulent, and doesn't mean anything. And, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I think that Joe Biden was the best thing to ever happen to Donald Trump, because <laughs> now that we've had four <laughs> years under Mr. Biden, people can honestly look at their finances, honestly look at, you know, at their home, their taxes, at where they are now, and be able to honestly look at where they are then. And the media, at this point, they can't lie anymore. They can't, you know, they can't use George Floyd anymore. They can't use this racist thing, that race thing. It's just not working anymore. And I mean, in black voters as well as many Latino voters are seeing that. So, I mean, I, I'm grateful, unfortunately, that this had to happen, but it was the only thing that could happen in order for us to even get to a place where we can get Donald Trump back for 2024. 
James. Shamika, you mentioned uh, the media before, and Benji, you did too, but Shamika, I want to ask you about this. We've got the New Hampshire primaries coming up this week. I have been hearing reports from on the ground that Democrats are planning to go and vote in the Republican primary for Nikki Haley to create noise and headwinds against Donald Trump so they can say, oh, look, Donald Trump's not that popular after all in New Hampshire. Um, <coughs> what is your read? on some of these tactics by Democrats to try and create that sort of noise in the media uh, to stop Donald Trump's momentum here. This is who they are. They are just a dis honest group of people. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is what they're planning to do, because they want to get people nervous and afraid and think, OK, it's pointless to go out and vote for him. But what we know is that the Democrats can't be trusted. More and more people are waking up to the devices that they use. And so I don't think it'll work. I do think that people are tired of Joe Biden, even the people that voted for him. So I think that still, People will get out and vote. Gas is too high. Food is too high. And people realize he's just a senile old man who most of the time don't even know that he's with us. And so whatever the <laughs> Democrats try, I don't think it's going to work. Benji, you'll remember that uh, it was a few years ago that I learned that you are not, in fact, black when Joe Biden told us that if you uh, didn't vote for Joe Biden, you weren't black. And, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, we, we, we all enjoyed that moment. Tell me what's been happening with the black and Hispanic votes uh, in, uh, you know, that is Trump drawing them back? What's happening there? Well, I think the biggest thing that's happening right now is um, legal immigration. I mean, we're seeing now that in a lot of black communities, we're having um, these illegals that are coming over our border. They're being put in Chicago. They're being put into New York. They're being put into all these places. And a lot of these places that they're being put, they're put into black communities. So now the black community has to look at itself and say, hey, look, these are the people that we've been voting for. And look at what they're doing. Look at who in a place where we're actually trying to go for, you know, reparations and having that conversation with black community. You have the, the people that you vote for, the Democrats you vote for, are literally putting people before you in your face in your community i mean there was a there was a community in brooklyn where they actually took a school um from the people of the neighborhood and decided to have the kids homeschool so that migrants can come live in the school so uh, it this is crazy so i feel like at this point black people we're at a place where we have to look at ourselves and say look you know clearly the democrats are not they're not in it for us they're 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 bringing people in our faces they're taking whatever the resources are that are supposed to be for us for our communities so you let me vote for and they are putting illegal immigrants over us so i think that's where a lot of the um change for trump is going to be coming from for 2024. liz Shamika, we've seen a lot happen this week in your neck of the woods, but who would you say that Donald Trump will pick for VP? <laughs> His son came out just this week and said Tucker Carlson isn't out of the question. I mean, obviously, that would be the 18 to end all 18s. Do you think there's any possibility of that happening? You know, I don't know, but I would like to keep Tucker in journalism. I feel like we really benefit from him getting out there and finding the truth on the things that the media tries to continue to lie to us about. So I would hate for us to actually, you know, lose that. I'm sure someone is looking at his spot thinking they can move into it. But I love Tucker doing exactly what he's doing, kind of keeping us informed on the things that they try to hide. So I hope that Tucker is not the one. But when I say, you know, it really doesn't matter to me who he chooses, I'm going to support him 100% either way. You know, there are a few people that I like. A lot of people don't like Vivek uh, Ramaswamy. I like Vivek. Um, and so I'm continuing to keep my eye on him. I do think that he has a political future ahead of him. And it could start with VP. We just don't know. Shemaker, Benji, uh, personally, I'd love to see Ron DeSantis and Trump. I've been saying that for four years. But anyway, don't know if that'll happen or not. But uh, let's... <laughs> not happen, says Benji. Ben, Benji's not going down that one. OK. Um, great to chat to you both. We'll chat again soon. Thank you so much, uh, Benji and Shemaker. Always great to have you here on Outsiders. Big year ahead. Still to come, we've got Warren Mundine right here to celebrate Australia Day with a great article he wrote in The Australian yesterday about Israel. Back in a tick. 
You're watching Outsiders with James Morrow, with Liz Storer filling in for Rita Panahi and myself, Rowan Dean. Well, Outsiders now in its eighth year. Thank you to you for making us the top rating show on Sky and staying with us from the beginning. So allow me to personally thank you for your loyalty. We do appreciate it. But buckle in, it's going to be a huge year. And for all you new viewers, this is going to be a massive Trump year right here on Outsiders. That's where you'll find everything Trump that's happening. But not only everything Trump. Last year was a big year. We campaigned aggressively against The Voice. We believed it was wrong. We were one of the first shows to come out and say that right at the beginning. And of course, two heroes of The Voice, Warren Mundine and Jacinta Price, are joining us here today, not only to talk about Australia Day, but also other things as well. So here he is, Warren Mundine. Welcome back to Outsiders. Happy New Year. Let's go to the wide shot so we can just show. There we go. That's our Australian flag. <laughs> During the break, I'd like to thank our team who rushed down to Woolworths and went, oh, sorry, no, they rushed next door to the other shop and found an Australian flag and brought it back to match our thongs here. So thank you to all involved in doing that. And I urge you to do the same thing. Get out there, buy your Australia Day merchandise. Was Happy Australia Day. Now, we'll talk about Happy that in Australia a second. Happy Australia Day to you, Stuart. We spoke to you yeah. last year uh, frequently about The Voice, but you had a sensational article in the Australian newspaper yesterday about Israel. And what disturbed me, one of the things that disturbed me, is the time, number of times we have seen people conflating pro-Palestinian imagery and politics with pro-Indigenous, yes. Australian yes. Uh, you see the flags going together. I saw uh, the tennis, Yvonne Goolagong, when she was there was a dance and someone was wearing one of those uh, kaffirs or whatever. Um, they conflate this indigenous politics with uh, supposedly pro-Palestinian politics. What do you make of that? You wrote an article about it in The Australian yesterday. Uh, look, it, it, just this insanity about saying that Jews are these colonisers of this area. There's a couple of things I, I, I wanted to really highlight. One is... The crap about the history. You know, you've got this incredible history. It's in the Bible. It's it's in the Koran. Uh, Israel has been there for thousands of years and it's in, in the Roman history and everything. And the, the whole thing just goes on. Jews have been in the Middle East, you know, since the record of time, yeah. you know. Uh, so, you know, I just find this, this insanity. You know, someone put a, a little post on my comments yesterday saying... Uh, you know, Israel's only been here since 1948. <laughs> and I'm, wow. And I'm, well, I don't know what school you went to, but... <laughs> you know, it's just this bizarre... So, so, look, to me it was about getting the, the facts out there. Yep. And, of course, there are some Palestinians who have been there in the beginning too. But the Arab... If you're talking about colonisers, it's the Arabs who come out of the peninsula, colonise North Africa, Spain and, and, and also the Middle East. And, uh, and so some of the original people who were there, of course, converted to Muslims and, and fitted in with, with the Arab community. But the vast, ma vast majority of them are Arabs. So this idea that the Jews are some, some interlopers late for, in history is just nonsense. I wanted to highlight that, and, and I wanted to highlight a number of other issues that are, that, that are in this area. And this is why I talk more about Hamas than about mentioning the Palestinians. It is these pro-Palestinians have a, a thing that's happening, or I shouldn't call it a thing, a war that's happening in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas into, uh, in they're saying, oh, we're pro-Palestinians. Then why are you in Australia protesting against other Australians in front of their synagogues? Mm -hmm. Why are you protesting on the steps of the Opera House and calling them Jews? And they say, but we're not anti-Semitic. Well, why are you doing that? Yeah, 100%, <laughs> James. And, I mean, Warren, just to sort of explore that idea a bit further, you know, it seems to me watching this, and I think you hit on this in your brilliant piece in The Australian, um, that really what we're talking about here are people on the left who are determined to pick up the cause of any cause, even if it's Hamas, who are a bunch of lunatics and murderers and rapists, if they demonstrate their anti-Western credentials. And is that how you wind up in this very strange position where you have the same activists, some activists, who 
say that Australia is proudly indigenous because indigenous people were here for 60,000 years, claiming also that Jews were only in Israel since, as you said, before 1948. <laughs> it's, it's, it's insanity, you know. Uh, it's, it's, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the Jews have been there. They are the indigenous people of the Middle East. Uh, and, and, and Israel is an Indigenous uh, country. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. And I also said that, you know, there are some Palestinians who are, were around with the Jews in those days uh, and, they, uh, and they've been uh, colonised by the Arabs and they've taken on Muslims and, they, and they've, they've moved along that way. But the vast majority, as I kept on saying, this nonsense about the Jews not being the Indigenous people of Israel, of that Middle East... It's just nonsense. And, and definitely Indigenous <laughs> Australians are, be, are being used, in my opinion, by the pro-Palestinian There's crowd. no doubt about that. And, and, and that's a tragedy. Now, just quickly before we go, Australia Day, I got my thongs here. They're all ready to go. Um, seriously, Warren, it, it, uh, at what point do we say this Invasion Day stuff, all this nonsense has, has got to stop? I mean, what are your thoughts on Australia Day? I know you've had different thoughts uh, that you've put forward, but what, what are your thoughts on where we are now yeah, at this point in time? Some, some of the dates I put forward are pretty useless. Being a good Australian, <laughs> having, have, having the 1st of January is a... <laughs> Mate, that cost me a public holiday. I'm <laughs> not going to give that up. But, but the reality is we have got so much to celebrate about this nation. Yeah. Now, we are probably one of the incredible nations that brought... You know, 26 million people from around the world, multicoloured, multicultural, multi-faith, even, you know, I used to like, uh, you know, uh, atheist until I found out Peter Fitzsimon was one. But we've got, <laughs> we, we've, got all, we've got all these amazing people in this country who have come here, and I'm proud they chose Australia, uh, to, to really build this country into an amazing place. We're, we're probably the most successful multi-everything mm. it, country in the world and we've been able to do these things and this is what, what I worry about this uh, war with Hamas is that you're getting this creeping in of mm. this anti-Semitic stuff and you, and you start and they're trying to make it mainstream now. And you, you've got this bizarre situation you have queers for, Pal uh, for Hamas and queers for Palestine yeah, yeah, you right. know, like if, you, if they uh, you know, LBGB plus communities went there they'd be thrown off a building They'd be killed. 100%. You know? So, uh, so I, I think we've got the greatest nations in the world. Hear, hear. I, got, I think we've got the incredible people in this country are working hard in that. The only problem has is that we haven't had too many good leaders. But, but we've got, you know, we've got one currently at the moment is stuffing this country up. It is... Uh, but I, I look at the Australian people, and this is why we won the referendum. We didn't talk to the corporates, we didn't talk to the elites, we didn't talk to the universities, we just went and talked to people on the street. Talked common sense to the Australian people. Warren, Absolutely. we've got to leave it there. Mm -hmm. Happy Australia Day to you, well, Warren. Thank you, and, all uh, the best to you, And to you, mate, and we'll talk, talk to you during the year. Back in a tick after this break. Coming up, lots. Hello. You're watching the first Outsiders of 2024. I surprised some of the people I was lucky enough to spend New Year's Eve with by announcing that 2024 is going to be a fantastic year. And so far, I haven't been disappointed. Peter Dutton has shown he is prepared to speak common sense on behalf of average Australians, standing up to the bullies at Woolies and supporting Israel unconditionally, unlike the Albo Clown Show. This is the year Donald Trump, Touchwood, returns to his rightful place as the elected president of the United States. This is, year, this is the year the public wake up to the sinister shenanigans of the globalist elites and say enough is enough. And this is the year that Peter Dutton, with your help and the help of this show, seals the fate of the lamentable Albanese government, the worst government in Australian history, a cabinet of clowns, and consigns it to the dustbin of history. Last year, this show proudly led the way in predicting and encouraging Australians to say no to The Voice. This year, we are saying no to Albo and we are saying no to Woke. And we invite you to join us. In a tick, we'll be chatting to one of the heroes of the No campaign, another one, Senator Jacinta Nampajimpa Price. But first, let's head over to Davos and the World Economic Forum's annual shindig where the appalling Antonio Guterres, head commissar of the United Socialist Nations, is outraged. 
I'm outraged that so many countries and companies are pursuing their own narrow interests without any consideration for our shared future or our common goals. And I'm certain that unless we take action, we can expect much, much worse. Oh, yes, poor old unelected Guterres is upset that there are democratic countries and citizens out there who value their own independence and political agency, and there are companies, still some, who still believe that their job is to make a profit. Dear, oh dear, what can be done, Antonio? So, dear friends, the institutions and frameworks of global governance, from the Security Council to the Bretton Woods system, were created 80 years ago. We can't build a future for our grandchildren with a system built for our grandparents. Oh, really, can't we? So we uh, translated from the original Communist Manifesto what Guterres basically is saying, let's scrap capitalism and democracy that have been so effective and impose socialist authoritarianism, which has been a disaster, which is built on surveillance and compliance and authoritarianism in the name of fighting climate change and mysterious pandemics. That's what they're threatening. Thus, as has been the case every year recently, much of the chat at Davos from bankers and woke business elites and socialists was around the tantalising introduction of digital passports and digital currencies. The interesting part of it is that, you know, yes, it is very necessary for financial services, but not only, sure. you know, it's also good for school enrollment, it's also good for health, who will actually go to vaccination or not. Uh, it's, it's very good to actually f to get your subsidies, you know, from the government. Yes, that was the unelected Queen of the Netherlands touting vaccines. Once you've signed up to your digital passport, then you'll have no choice other than to, other than to comply with this doozy, a longtime favourite of the Davos crowd. We're developing, through technology, an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So individual carbon footprint tracker. Hmm. Stay tuned. We don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. Be careful. You hear the words central CBDC, central business digital, central bank digital currencies or digital passports. That's what's coming down the line for you. Now, you may be thinking that this totalitarian dystopian nightmare is just around the corner, which it is. So why am I positive about 2024? Well, because the harder these lunatics push these agenda, the more the public or at least some of the public, is waking up. This is the year of the common sense revolution. It was a delight to see Klaus Schwab, viewed by many as the best Bond villain Ian Fleming never invented, complaining that, quote, a political revolution has destroyed his appalling great reset. Good. Klaus Blofeld, sorry, Klaus Schwab, blames something he calls libertarianism, which wants to tear down the system, his system, as being the root of all evil. Really? In fact, the political revolution Klaus complains about is called common sense. And the common sense revolution is the enemy of globalist power trips and authoritarian fantasists. As we are now seeing, in America this week, House Republicans introduced a defund Davos Act designed to withdraw all federal funds going to the World Economic Forum. Common sense revolution. Even here in Australia, according to the Financial Review, our business and political elites are shunning Davos. Very few business leaders and no ministers have bothered to attend this year. In fact, laughably, the only prominent elite we have sent to hobnob with <coughs> B-grade lovey celebrities like pop star Sting was our own yesterday's man, Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister and summit junketeer par excellence. Much like Sting, it's been many, many years since Kev has been a hit in the charts. But never fear. As I said, 2024 is the year of common sense and political change, and it kicked off with an almighty bang 
Right here at Davos, in an act of undercover subversion and villain slaying better than any James Bond film, a secret undercover hero took to the stage at Davos this year and blew the entire globalist enterprise to smithereens. Yes, the new James Bond was newly elected president of Argentina, Javier Millet, who spoke for 23 minutes in what the Finn described as the fieriest speech ever delivered at Davos. I'd love to play the whole speech to you, but I urge you to watch it online later after the show. It is dubbed, weirdly, by AI, quite remarkably into English, but with Javier's accent. I've selected what for me were the highlights, but basically Javier warns that it is Davos and the global elites, the audience in front of him, who are the real problem in today's world, and he warns that the entire West, all of us, are in perilous danger. As he explains in great detail, capitalism has been subverted by big governments of all persuasions working with massive, out-of-control bureaucracies and these unelected institutions that produce nothing nothing but siphon off the productivity and the wealth, endlessly increasing the taxes on everyday productive citizens to feed the vanity projects of the parasitic elites and an out-of-control welfare state that is pure socialism in all but name. And socialism, as Javier repeatedly <coughs> points out, always ends in poverty, destitution and death. Today, I am present to inform you that the Western world is facing a significant threat. It is in danger because those who are supposed to defend the values of the Western world are co-opted by a worldview that inevitably leads to socialism and consequently to poverty and economic deprivation. Now, when studying per capita GDP from 1800 to today, what is observed is that after the Industrial Revolution, global per capita GDP multiplied by more than 15 times, generating an explosion of wealth that lifted 90% of the world's population out of poverty. We must never forget that by the year 1800, about 95% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty, while that number dropped to 5% by the year 2020 prior to the pandemic. The conclusion is obvious. Far from being the cause of our problems, free market capitalism as an economic system is the only tool we have to end hunger, poverty, and destitution throughout the planet. In other words, the capitalist, the successful entrepreneur, is a social benefactor who contributes to the well-being of society as a whole. In short, a successful entrepreneur is a hero because it should never be observed that socialism is always and everywhere impoverishing, failed in all countries where attempted. It was a failure economically, it was a failure socially, it was a failure culturally, and it also killed more than 100 million human beings. Indeed. After pointing out the manifest successes of capitalism and the failures of so socialism, Javier Millet then describes in great detail how the free markets have been completely compromised by Western governmental bureaucratic intervention. And he asserts, as an economist, that there is no such thing by definition as market failure. And indeed, that the only time markets fail is where there is some form of state intervention or coercion. Indeed... Net zero, renewable subsidies, taxes, red tape, green tape, black tape. President Millet then goes on to list how the West has embraced any number of social justice causes, such as feminism, climate change, yada, yada, that have distorted and destroyed our productive markets. The solution that collectivists will propose is not greater freedom, but greater regulation generating a downward spiral of regulations until we all become poorer and the lives of all of us depend on a bureaucrat sitting in a luxury office. This radical feminism agenda has led to increased state intervention, hindering the economic process. 
It provides jobs to bureaucrats who haven't contributed anything to society, whether through women's ministries or international organizations promoting this agenda. Unfortunately, these harmful ideas have strongly permeated our society. Neo-Marxists have managed to co-opt the common sense of the Western world. They achieved this through the appropriation of the media, culture, universities, and yes, even international organizations. Fortunately, more of us dare to raise our voices as we see that if we don't confront these ideas head on, the only possible destiny is more state, more regulation, more socialism, more poverty, less freedom, and consequently, a worse quality of life. Sound familiar? Javier Millet then lists all the various so-called political ideologies from fascists and communists to social democrats, globalists, Keynesians, whatever, and concludes they are all ultimately collectivists who believe the state should control you, the individual, rather than libertarians who believe the individual must be free in order for society as a whole to prosper to its full capacity, free of excessive bureaucratic burdens, free of all the regulations and red tape and increased taxes. This is the warning Australia, heading down the same path as Argentina, urgently needs to listen to before it is too late. The Argentine case is the empirical proof that regardless of wealth, natural resources, population capability, education level, or the amount of gold bars in the central bank's coffers, these factors do not guarantee success. If measures are adopted that hinder the free functioning of markets, free competition, free price systems, if trade is hindered, if private property is attacked, the only possible destination is poverty. This is the path Australia is now on. Renewables targets and net zero have comprehensively distorted our markets, subsidies, all that stuff. Labor's endless red tape, green tape and now black tape is crippling not only industry and manufacturing, we heard earlier how it is plummeting manufacturing in this country, but small businesses and entrepreneurs, you know, you know, you feel it. You try and set up a cafe or a job or a shop. We are no longer the Australia of freedom and innovation. Look around you. We are hurtling towards being the new Argentina. Don't be intimidated by the political caste or the parasites who live off the state. Don't yield to a political class that only wants to prolong its power and preserve its privileges. Do not yield to the advance of the state. The state is not the solution. The state is the problem itself. As I said, if this were a James Bond film, Javier Millet was George Lazenby, 007, undercover in the Smirsch villain's sinister lair high in the Swiss Alps. And, well... But wait, there was more. Bond had, as always, his American sidekick, his the Heritage Foundation's Kevin Roberts. President Trump, if he's the next president, for that matter, I think whoever the next conservative president, is going to take on the power of the elites, which I mentioned earlier. But there, the, the thing that I want to drive home here, the very reason that I'm here at Davos, is to explain to many people in this room and who are watching, with all due respect, nothing personal, but that you're part of the problem. Ultimately, Robin, I think President Trump, if in fact he wins a second term, is going to be inspired by the wise words of Javier Millet, who said that he was in power not to guide sheep, but to awaken lions. Indeed. Kevin, Robbins went, Kevin Roberts went on to say, and I love this, that the agenda that every member of the Trump administration has is to compile a list of everything that's ever been proposed at the World Economic Forum and ditch it all. And right on cue, just when you thought the Chinese-style surveillance digital passport CBDC world is inevitable, up popped Trump. And tonight, I'm also making another promise to protect Americans from government tyranny. As your president, I will never allow the creation of a central bank digital currency. Do you know about that? Hoorah. Yes, I've got a feeling 24 is going to be a good year. Millet, Trump, Poilier in Canada, Dutton here. It's time to wake up, Lions. The common sense revolution is here. 
Well, she's a great friend of this show and a hero of last <coughs> year and of the years to come. Senator Jacinta Nampajimpa Price, great to see you as always. Happy New Year. Happy Australia Day. We've got our flag here. <laughs> You're in the right place there. How are you, Jacinta? And how will you be celebrating? Hey! hey! Well done, Jacinta. <laughs> um, congratulations on the great success of The Voice last year. That was terrific. That was common sense. Uh, you were a hero. I don't need to tell you that. Yeah, um, yeah. How are you celebrating Australia Day, Jacinta? Oh, look, first of all, happy 2024. I feel it's going to be a great year ahead. Look, I will be on the road. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I won't be amongst crowds of people, but I will be, well, in the lead up to Australia Day, I will be, but... On the day itself, I will very likely be on the road between Broken Hill and Cuba PD um, with my best mate, my husband, by my side. And we've just been, you know, driving around the country and really taking in um, what it is we have here in, the, in this beautiful part of the world that is Australia. And uh, I, I think that's, you know, we, we are so lucky. We are spoiled uh, in this country. Uh, but I'll be appreciating what it is we have uh, from the outback, from the road, uh, which is what I love to do, get out on that road. Now, Jacinta, when you get back to work, I'll just tell you, some, one of the things that I'm hoping you will be looking at is auditing all this expenditure on Indigenous uh, affairs. Um, obviously, some of it is necessary, but uh, I was sent uh, 270 pages of grants, totaling hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, going to all sorts of extraordinary things. There's a long, long list. We've put them up there on the screen briefly, but it's all sorts of, apart from uh, small amounts here and there, there are very large amounts. It goes on and on and on. Jacinta, will you be able to, Senator, tackle this expenditure and should there be an audit? Look, absolutely, there should be an audit, and that's something that should occur immediately. Uh, given the cost of living crisis we're faced with, given the fact that obviously this, uh, you know, the closing the gap targets are never actually really closing, and they're not closing probably deliberately because there's an entire industry that relies on that gap uh, existing. So going forward, we'll continue to be calling for an audit. Uh, and if this government refuses uh, to, you know, to agree that this is actually a good idea and initiate that, uh, then that's what we'll be doing. Uh, that'll be what we'll be doing uh, when we work hard uh, to take uh, to take government at the next federal election. Uh, these are the, the these are the measures that I will be taking uh, as shadow minister for Indigenous. Sorry, if if I if I land the role of minister for Indigenous Australians, uh, <laughs> then that needs absolutely to be sorted out. James. Well, just said, I'm looking at um, some of these grants here and, you know, don't want to say that any of them is not legitimate or a good s spending of money, but I'm looking at things on everything from, uh, you know, payments for bush tucker morning teas to a companion animal program to a crocodile hatchery to social emotional well-being programs, cultural experiences, all sorts of things here. Now, millions of dollars just on the couple of pages that I'm looking at here what concerns me is not so much the investment in these communities, but the fact that there seems to be so little to show in terms of where any of this is actually going to closing the gap. Um, what is the connection between mm -hmm. some of these? And is this what really needs to be looked at is whether or not there's enough sort of when they're making the decisions, running a rule over these applications, saying this is actually going to really genuinely do something to improve school outcomes, health outcomes, or whether, you know, it's more the vibe of the thing, to borrow from a famous phrase. Mm. Yeah, look, absolutely. I think there's lots of different categories that pop up uh, all the time uh, Look to look at ways that, you know, taxpayer, taxpayer funds can be, uh, you know, funneled into different directions and uh, individuals can um, certainly uh, be at advantage uh, of those funds. But you're right. Uh, we need to be focusing on the issues that are most important, which are, you know, education, uh, which is employment, uh, which is health. Uh, if those measures aren't being met, then I'm sorry. Um, you know, if there's some sort of, uh, you know, program that's, uh, that's centred around... Uh, something ambiguous around culture or those sorts of things, I think we really have to look at uh, what outcomes it's actually providing uh, and whether it's um, uh, putting it against those measures, education, health, uh, employment, whether it's making any impact in those areas uh, whatsoever that are actually far more important. You know, I get people 
come to me regularly who are concerned about programs, um, you know, particularly there's some around uh, Indigenous language revival, uh, whether languages are being revived appropriately, what's the purpose once they are uh, revived. But there's, there's lots of areas that are pretty ambiguous that um, need uh, to be looked at with a fine-tooth comb uh, and under the microscope, really. Um, sorry, Liz, off you go. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Jacinda, you backed Dutton's call for a boycott of Woolies as they once again uh, begin their war on Australia Day and therefore our national pride. We know this is all about just manipulating the, the social conscience, the public and how they feel about the day. Uh, have you got any pushback mm. for that? Because Woolworths would have us believe they themselves haven't really received any mm. pushback. What, what's your feels been on the ground? Do you think people are willing to take that move? Do you think we'll, we'll see it move the needle at all? Yeah, look, I mean, I'm here at the Tamworth Country Music Festival uh, and I've been speaking to people all over the place and there's a lot of very proud Australians that are donning their Australian flag uh, everywhere I go uh, of all different backgrounds and they're really displeased with the way in which Woolworths has conducted itself. Uh, I mean, most people that I've spoken to have said, yeah, I, I, you know, I used to be a loyal shopper at Woolworths. I, I'll no longer go there um, because of this continued sort of behaviour disregarding uh, that the majority of Australians don't want this sort of division um, going on. But that's that's generally the feeling that I'm getting on the ground. And, you know, stopping off in, uh, in country towns, uh, you know, I've, I've been across the Barkley, over to the Sunshine Coast, um, throughout Queensland and here in New South Wales. And the feeling on the ground is that Australians are just over it. You know, they're more worried about... Uh, the cost of living, uh, they don't want to have to deal with the corporates trying to uh, tell them how to suck eggs, tell them how they <laughs> should behave or think or feel or, uh, you know, feel about the country that they love. I mean, this is home. Uh, they're sick of being shamed to be uh, proud Australians. Well, Jacinta, Senator Price, uh, last year you certainly spoke on behalf of so many Australians. You told us, you showed us that common sense will win. We are in a common sense revolution, I believe. And uh, you, your common sense will be needed more than ever in the next uh, 15 months, I guess, until we see you back in uh, Parliament in government, which is where you belong, running the show. Looking forward to it very much. Senator Jacinta Price, thanks so much for talking to us today. Uh, and have a wonderful Australia Day. There you go. Isn't she fantastic? Senator Jacinta Nampajimpa Price. Up next, we'll be talking, we've got Liz's editorial and we've got a special guest who's come back from Israel, Michael Kroger, in a tip. Hello, you're watching Outsiders with Rowan Dean, James Morrow, and I'm Liz Stora filling in for Rita Panahi. Now, Woolies has been copping a lot of flack lately, but to really understand who's the real villain in this tale, you've got to take two seconds to look at its two major shareholders. Who are they? BlackRock and Vanguard. In truth, Woolies isn't making these decisions. They must do as they're told by their owners in order for us to do as we're told by their owners. We know that's how it works. That's the whole point of the political weaponization of corporates. If you're not familiar with the radical left behemoth of BlackRock, it is the world's largest asset management company, the world's largest money manager. Basically, they and Vanguard, which is exactly the same, just slightly smaller, own and thereby control far more of what goes on in our world than you or I could possibly imagine. Remember when Woolies campaigned for The Voice last year? Let's take a moment to appreciate how absurd that is. A supermarket championing constitutional change. Random, right? No, actually, not now that you know who owns the most. How about Woolies' decision this year not to celebrate Australia? Did you think that was just a decision made by some sort of Woolies board around a boardroom table? Nope. Same shareholders pushing the same agenda. 
On Wednesday, 2GB revealed that buried in Woolworth's reconciliation action plan, what are they even doing with such a thing, was a commitment to display Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags outside stores, sites and support offices where practicable. Uh, no mention of the Australian flag, of course. Here is their action plan with the relevant po pay point rather on page 31 so they meant business but after being busted on Wednesday Thursday a woolly spokesperson hastened to clarify oh no we, we don't plan to add flags outside our supermarkets uh, we're, we're just saying we're practicable we're talking about other sites the three flags this spokesperson said oh nice first mention of the Australian flag in there will be flown at these sites all together just like a school just like other institutions wow looks like even they knew they were accelerating a bit too fast for once huh weird that that detail was missing from their actual plan tell you who knows all this regarding the all-powerful globalist shareholders controlling woolies and that's the leader of the opposition peter dutton Listen carefully to what he said the day he called for a boycott. I think they're trying to please their, their investors. They're trying to please uh, the political leader of the day. And a lot of the investors, uh, a lot of the industry super funds who are investing into Woolworths and ASX companies otherwise uh, demand all of these woke agendas. And, uh, and the, the CEOs and the boards believe that they need to implement it. And it means that the... People like Alan Joyce becomes very friendly with Anthony Albanese. People like Brad Benducci become very friendly with Anthony Albanese and they subscribe to that left-wing ideology. And He knows what's up. He's not going to name BlackRock and Vanguard, but he's talking to them. And if you listen, you'll know that he's a man who knows exactly what I'm saying. Last but certainly not least, there's the small matter of Woolies supporting the Albanese government's digital ID bill introduced last year. Yep, here's their submission in response to the digital ID bill on the 13th of October last year, stating they quote, fully support measures to promote enhanced use of digital ID services, end quote. And on what I'm sure is an entirely unrelated note, Woolworths just happens to have 75% shares in Quantium, a data analytics firm with deep AI, data science and data engineering skills. Hmm. They acquired 50% of the company back in 2013, but get this, the Australian government has paid Quantium millions of our taxpayers over the last few years and Quantium's biggest shareholders are, by virtue of being Woolworths, BlackRock and Vanguard. See how this works? Of course you do. You're an outsider. Now, Dutton has copped a lot of flack for calling for this boycott, but I'm with him. It's time we flip the bird to these globalist flogs. This is their agenda. Woolworths is merely one of their many tools. It's time to start shopping at farmers markets like the good old days where we always, that's where we got all our food and where our money goes directly to those who actually deserve it. Fantastic, thanks Liz. Absolutely 100%. Now, former Victorian Liberal President Michael Kroger has just spent the last week in Israel and unlike a certain foreign minister, he actually visited the October 7th massacre sites, the hostage sites and much more. Something our foreign minister should have done but didn't. Michael joins us now. Michael Kroger, welcome back. Uh, Happy New Year. Happy Australia Thanks, Day. <laughs> and you. Great to see and you. you. And uh, tell us about Israel. Well, it was the best of times and worst of times, Rowan. Uh, the stoicism and firmness and unity of the Jewish people uh, to stick together, uh, given what happened on October 7, is uh, wonderful to see. On the other hand, visiting those sites, um, I went down to the Nova Music Festival site in Riem, which is sort of halfway down. Uh, I went to Kibbutz um, uh, Oz, which is 
sort of facing Khan Yunus um, and um, Kafar Azar, which is another kibbutz in, in the north um, of the Gaza area on the Israeli side, obviously. And those three hot sites were shockingly hit, mate. I also saw the 47-minute uh, 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 IDF video that the Israeli army have put together, yeah. um, and I know many people in the media have seen it. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of work. It's taken from the head cameras of the Hamas fighters in many respects. Uh, their mobile phones, uh, security cameras, uh, and there are some shocking scenes I'll, I'll actually never get out of my head, um, particularly the one where the woman's... A woman Palestinian savage is just saying Allah Akbar as uh, she's encouraging uh, people just to shoot uh, Jews uh, at, at the music festival and, uh, and, and other places. And she's just saying Allah Akbar, isn't this fantastic? And the, and the joy in the faces of these Palestinian savages uh, as they were killing these innocent Jews is just frightening, mate. It was frightening to see and it was frightening to be at these places and... You know, it's one. Some of these sites are one 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 kilometre um, from the kibbutz. You've got the kibbutz, you've got farmland, you've got a couple of insipid uh, wire fences, and then you've got the Palestinian town in Gaza, uh, which is why it was so easy, mate, for them to come across the border when they wanted to, and um, slaughter these innocent men, women, women, and, and children. James, uh, this is footage. Of, this is footage of. Um, um, kibbutz near Oz, um, which is just near... Uh, that's facing um, a town, um, um, Kuza, and just behind that is is, um, is Khan Yunus. So that's down in the south. But that um, there was shocking damage there. At that kibbutz, um, uh, f- f- 60, they took 60 hostages. Uh, they slaughtered 40 people. They took 60 hostages, um, and 30 of the hostages have been let go. That's at the Lebanese border. Um, it's two kilometres from a kibbutz there. That zigzag line, Rowan, is a is a is a um, concrete fence, and over the top of that hill, that's the Lebanese border. Uh, that's uh, that's at Elon, looking at Adamit. Adamit is on the the town on the top there. Um, so uh, many people watching will know these towns better than me, which is why I've got to get the pronunciation right. But. Um, no, the stoicism of the Jewish people has been and was extraordinary to be there last week. And um, I bought for my friend Shari Markson, who's been wonderful, reporting wonderfully from Hostage Square on Thursday. I bought her this, which is a Bring Them Home uh, T-shirt, which I'm going to send to Shari. And I also Absolutely. bought her um, this, which is worn by many people, just uh, Bring Them Home, which is a message to Hamas. Please let the 136 hostages you still got um, um, go. Uh, James, and, uh, of course, Rowan. This whole wall. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Yeah. Oh, look, I was just going to say, um, Michael, you said that the pol- politics of Israel right now are very united, obviously, and stoic about what's happened. What is the uh, general feeling in Israel about the wider conflict uh, that now seems to be developing involving Iran, the Houthis, and is there any discontent with the way the United States has handled its relationship with Iran, i.e., that over the last several years, you know, under Biden and Obama before him? They have encouraged the Iranian regime and essentially empowered um, Hamas by their offices. Very complex question. The Israelis give the Americans a lot of credit for warning Iran uh, to stop Hezbollah invading uh, the northern parts of Israel. They think the Americans warning to Iran stop Hezbollah invading. Um, but uh, look, all roads lead to Iran, don't they? I mean, uh, I- Iran, Hezbollah, Iran, Hamas, Iran, the Houthis, um, Iran have got senior officials in Syria, in Lebanon. All roads lead back to, Ala- uh, to Iran. Until such time, James, as the Western world uh, takes stock of Iran and deals with Iran, you're not going to have peace in the Middle East because you have effectively a Cold War going on between Iran and the Saudis. <laughs> Uh, most countries, by the way, most of the Arab countries in the in in in, in, um, in the Middle East are opposed to Iran. Until mm. the West and the world deals with Iran, there will be no peace in the Middle East. Two state solution or not? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Michael Kroger. And uh, on that note, Australia has shamed itself by not being able to send uh, any any worthwhile military equipment right. over there. Sure. Uh, Michael Kroger, welcome back to Australia and happy Australia Day. After the break, a brand new segment, Ringmaster Rowan's. Clown watch in a tick. Roll 
up, roll up, ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages and all 52 genders, it's Ringmaster Rowan's clown show from the Burley Griffin Big Top right here on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin with all the thrills and spills of the Labour Circus. Sorry, I mean Labour Caucus, known to many as the clown... as the greatest show on earth. Clowns, of course, come in all shapes and sizes, and every week I will be bringing you some of Australia's greatest clown acts. There's the comical slapstick clown, of course, like pie in the face Bowen, fresh back from his hilarious performance at the COP28 circus in Dubai, where he won Climate Clown of the Year for his hilarious welcome to country ceremony in the desert sands of Dubai. Plus, we've got your more traditional clown. Here's Al Bozo, the clown without his makeup on, who's more of a mime artist these days having never recovered from losing his voice last year. Then there's the creepy clown, and there's plenty of those under the Barton Big Top, or even worse, there's the scary clown. Yes, Pennywise the Clown, created by none other than master horror writer Stephen King, was possibly the scariest clown ever conceived of. He certainly scared the kiddies, witless. Well, though, down here. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Ha 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 But ladies and gentlemen, do I have an even scarier clown for you? Pennywise the Clown has been replaced by Penny Wong the Clown. Yes, even Stephen King couldn't create a scarier character than Penny Wong the Clown, crawling straight out of the deepest depths of Labour's factional sewers and the Lake Burley Griffin Swamp. Certainly. Nobody was laughing this week when Penny Wong the Clown embarked on her sellout tour of the Middle East, aptly named because she managed to sell out the entire Jewish population of Australia in what the Sydney Morning Herald described as Penny Wong's tightrope act by refusing to visit the site of the October 7 atrocities in which hundreds of Jewish girls and women were raped, murdered and butchered, which is the equivalent of going on a tourist trip to Treblinka but not bothering to visit the Holocaust Museum there. Showing that even the folk at the Sydney Morning Herald like a good belly laugh, the paper claimed that, quote, Australia's favourite MP, that'd be Penny Wong the Clown, is going to walk a very tight rope. Of course, it's only a scary tightrope act if you're terrified of putting a woke foot wrong and if you see some clownish cl kind of moral equivalence between Hamas's barbaric butchery and savage murders, rapes and dismemberments of October 7th and the legitimate right, indeed responsibility, of the Israeli government to completely annihilate Hamas and destroy its terror network in order to protect its civilian population from Islamist-inspired genocide so that it never happens again. Poor old Penny Wong the Clown, it seems, can't quite get her act together, even though she no doubt had one of Canberra's top bureaucrats from the Department of Foreign Affairs preparing her for her high-wire tightrope act. Here he is. My skit is called Tightrope Walker. Seems, however, that the crowds are not very impressed by Penny Wong. The Australian Jewish Association described it as an outrageous insult to Jews and disturbing behaviour. Quote, 
The news that our foreign minister, Senator Penny Wong, during her visit to Israel, will not visit the southern communities which were subject to the barbaric Hamas terrorism on October 7th is a major shock, said AJA President David Adler, pointing out all those political leaders from the US, the UK and Europe who have done just that, as well as the Liberal Party's own Sen Senator Simon Birmingham. Well done, I say, Senator Birmingham. Deputy Leader Susan Lay, Deputy Liberal Leader Susan Lay, said it was unforgivable that Wong did not go. She should see the areas that on October the 7th changed this landscape forever, both politically and for the communities, Susan Lay said. But it just got worse. Penny Wong the Clown started spraying our money around like confetti out of a circus cannon with a further $21 million of your hard-earned taxpayers' dollars, including no less than $6 million to the sinister ANWAR, the United Nations Relief and Works Association agency responsible for teaching Muslim children as young as kindergarten to hate and want to kill Jews like this. التي تغنى بها كل الحكام العرب فظل الحراك الشعبي الفلسطيني وصولا الى تاسيس اول حركه تحرر وطني وانطلاق Yes, ladies and gentlemen, even Stephen King never dreamt up anything as evil as teaching your children to murder their Jewish neighbours, something which no doubt contributed to the horrifying events of October 7th. But Penny Wong the Clown is happy to pour $6 million into the coffers of Palestinian extremists and UNWA whilst offending and belittling the suffering of the Jews by going to Israel but steering clear of the scenes of the atrocities. So how did her high-wire trapeze act go like this? Yes, Penny Wong the Clown's High Wire Act was a disaster. After disgracefully handing over our money, suddenly she announces that she will tell the terrorists not to misuse any of our money or something like that. Quote, Minister Penny Wong has told Palestinian Authority officials that Australia's latest funding package for Gaza, intended to pay for civilian health care and childhood education, ooh, must be managed carefully to prevent the taxpayer resources being misused by terrorists. What an absolute clown show. Yes, it's all just another day at Al Bozo's circus, as the entire Labour circus, sorry, caucus, flounders around trying to perform the high-wire juggling act of pretending to show some kind of support for Israel whilst simultaneously pandering to the worst prejudices of the extremists in Labour's Muslim electorates. What a joke. So make sure you tune in every week, folks, as I crack the whip and bring you the exciting adventures from under the burly griffin big top with Ringmaster Rowan's clown show. What would Dame Judy Dench say? Where are the clowns? Send in the clowns. Hyperbole, extreme exaggeration, hyperbole, as pronounced by Julia Gillard. We've got to... Here's jo uh, Justin Trudeau. Let's go straight to Justin, who's telling us the big issue facing Canadians this year. What could it be? Well, I think Canadians, not just in Nunavut, but right across the country, are going to have a really important choice coming up in the next election. Do we want to continue to fight climate change? Is that it, James? Is that the big issue facing I'm going to say the answer that's no, but... <laughs> <laughs> Liz? This is a 
exactly what Labor did. This is exactly what Labor did. Climate action is on the ballot. The Liberals are doing nothing. If you care about the world, vote for us. And well, yet Trudeau's been in power for years. And so you know they've got this Pierre Paul Vega. Paul, 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 yeah. Paul, Paul yeah. Yeah. sorry. Genius. That's, He's that's going to be Mr. That Common any Sense. chance of a change there. But exactly. um, anyway. Uh, weekly Wokely. Let's do a little bit of uh, the NFL. What? We've got a black national anthem, James. Who knew? Who do? Um, look, we began the program today by talking about uh, racial separatism here in Australia, and of course, we're just taking a page out of the American book here. Um, the National Football League, which of course has been beset by woke separatist controversies like taking the knee and Colin, Colin Kaepernick and things like that, um, they're now going to be singing something called the Black National Anthem at the Super Bowl, which Google tells me is a song called Lift Every Voice and Sing. The problem with this, of course, is that there's only one American national anthem, and the whole point is that it is for everybody who is American, and I would say, frankly, separating people by their race and what anthem they sing, that's actually a bit un-American. You would have thought, no doubt. Don't give them ideas. We'll be, it'll be the treaty. Treaty will be the next one at the whatever cricket or whatever. Uh, Liz, you've got a good Sports Illustrated story for us. Uh, another form of go work, go broke. So Sports Illustrated in 2020 decide to use a trans model on the cover of their 2020 issue, and they've kept this up in successive magazines. Well, it will come as a shock to no one that news broke this week that much of the staff of Sports Illustrated and possibly all remaining writers and editors received layoff notices on Friday because they're not doing so well. Turns out, not all sex sells, just some. <laughs> well, I Are think you it's surprised, James? Well, look, a... I think actually it's important not to sort of turn this around too much because the thing is actually is that Sports Illustrated had been a declining brand forever. So really what the lesson here is that when you are in decline, don't try these stunts to try and get some media hype and attention because it's not that they went broke because they did these stunts. They went, were going broke and then they decided to start doing these woke stunts to try and get some controversy and maybe sell some copies or something. That's actually, you know, the correct order in which these things always wind up occurring. Yeah, exactly. And another bit of lefty lunacy which we enjoyed here was uh, a Greens, a former New Zealand Green Party MP, James and Liz, has been charged with two counts of shock. Lifting, uh, stealing a designer handbag, Liz. Oh, Can you so this believe wasn't it? a cost of living crisis <laughs> no, type exactly. thing. They're Probably just trying to get well, across the line. A designer uh, handbag. Uh, well, that's a must. They're unbelievable. Aren't they? That's it for Outsiders. We will see you next Sunday, 9 a.m. Have a fantastic Australia Day. Whoa, <laughs> where's that wide shot? See the flag. <laughs> see ya. Have a good one.